Hey, hi. <laughs> Thanks for coming back and joining me. Today, as you may have seen, I am going to do an October wrap up. Now, I know October happened like 1 million years ago at this point, but I read a lot of really good books and a lot of books from my own collection. Whether they were acquired prior to or during October is none of your business. Might be a little bit of your business. Um, but I didn't want to just ignore them. I still wanted to talk about them. And November has been kind of rough for me in terms of both reading and just it's it's been a rough month. So I will hopefully still do a November wrap up as well. Um, but I've just been behind and I will do my best. Uh, my thoughts I never claim are, you know, wonderful and the beacon of all thoughts on books, but I like to babble about books. So here we are. Thanks for joining. Um, the first book I read this month was Through the Woods by Emily Carroll. This is a graphic novel, but it's like a bunch of little short stories. My book club actually read this and we've all just been having trouble concentrating, but we still wanted something kind of spooky. So we picked this. It was fun. I, the art style was interesting. I don't, I'm not going to have anything but the cover to show, but there were lots of little twists and some of the stories it felt like it was about getting to the twist and then having a twist and then like, oh, look at that twist. So I would have liked for some of them to go on a little bit longer, but I also think that it's aimed at younger readers. So, and it was properly atmospheric. It was spooky. My book club did really enjoy it. There was a story in there that made me think of the Green Ribbon a uh, young reader story. So that was, it, it felt nostalgic. It felt like something that when I was young, I would have picked up for a spooky good time. And I'm a scaredy cat. So I, I don't remember if I ever read this, the scary books that are extremely nostalgic now. But I did read Green Ribbon. Sorry, I may be going in and out with coffee. So that was fun. The next book I read was a romance. Um, I need to get this type right. If I'm looking off my story graphs over here, sorry. A Duke, the Lady and the Baby by Vanessa Riley. Sorry, that title, it's like, it's like three men and a baby, but more. <laughs> so this follows um, our protagonist, Patience. Oh, what, I've already forgot the hero's name. So Patience is a woman of color in Regency, I believe it's Regency England, and her husband has died and she has a young son. And based on the law, her son is basically no longer hers. And she's also been put, the relative, a relative of her deceased husband has tried to put her in an asylum. So basically she's like sneaking back to take care of her son. And by take care of, we really mean at first like breastfeed. There's a lot of breastfeeding in this book. And I'm not someone to mom shame, so it was just it is something that stuck out to me as someone who has never breastfed, like just how descriptive it was about her breastfeeding situation, and it talked about it a lot. Um, that was just one thing that stuck out to me. It also had a hero who was in a, the war, I think the Napoleonic Wars, I clearly didn't pay as much attention as I should have. Um, and he has been injured and and he's dealing with the after effects of that and his body being, having more limits than he's used to and what that means. And then coming in and taking control of this household and Patience has kind of slipped in as a servant undercover and is taking care of her son as a servant. So there's a lot of layers there. Additionally, her husband, she believes has, he, she believes he died by suicide and she has a lot to unpack and, and deal with there. So there's a lot of grief and anger and sadness and fear. And in the midst of all of this, she's just trying to take care of her son. So it's, it was a really intriguing, romance that had a lot more going on than just the romance. The next book I've already talked about, that's Watch Over Me by Nina LaCour. 
loved it. Um, still just a lyrical, haunting narrative about finding our place and finding family and dealing with trauma. And it just does it in a beautiful, lyrical, haunting way. And I know I'm using the same adjectives over and over, but you know, okay. Blood and Honey by Shelby Mahuren. I haven't talked about. This is the sequel to Serpent and Dove. So I, this Serpent and Dove was a much buzzier book than I even knew. I really, really enjoyed A Serpent and Dove last year. And I wasn't as active on the book internet in terms of like booktube or bookstagram. So I, when I joined or became more active on those platforms earlier this year, I, I just hadn't realized how resonant Serpent and Dove was with the reading community. And I wasn't surprised. And I shouldn't have been surprised because it, it was a really good, engaging narrative. Um, and it also had, you know, hate to love, which is one of my favorite tropes and is a lot of people's favorite tropes, I guess is what I'm getting at. So I talked about that briefly, I think, in an old video, but this is the sequel. It picks up where we left off. We spend most of this book in a forest and per it's perfect, right? Okay, because this is setting up a, like a trilogy, I believe. This is clearly a middle book. We just are dealing with the, a lot of the after, um, a lot of the fallout from the previous book. So we are in a time of transition and change and uncertainty for a lot of these characters. So to do that in a forest where we have a liminal space and that kind of represents transition, it just makes sense. Now, I am a sucker for a forest and a liminal space, so I will probably talk about that a lot. And this, I think, does a really good job at being a really solid sequel that builds on our characters. It doesn't have easy answers, right? So we had the reveal at the end of Serpent and Dove, and now our characters have to deal with that. And it's not as easy as it could be, which is good. We There's a lot of internal and external conflict in this and our characters are just kind of having to figure out who they are, what they stand for, and if that has changed at all from when we started Serpent and Dove. And it has and it hasn't. So real good. Um, I also was excited because I didn't realize the author was a Hoosier. <laughs> And I'm real excited. I'm, I grew up in Indi Indiana, rural Indiana. So anytime we get positive Hoosier, positive Hoosiers, I'm, I'm all for it because we don't have, we have too many non-positive Hoosiers in the spotlight. Anyway, so A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik. I was about halfway through this book when I happened to see some of the discourse on Twitter about racism and microaggressions in this book. So I did not post this with a firm rating review anywhere because I didn't think that I could do justice to the analysis or the depth of commentary on that as is warranted, right? Like, I, I cannot judge how harmful those instances in this book were, and I do believe that they harmed readers. That, I am, I have really taken a line I'm like listening to own voices reviewers on. I, I'm not gonna speak to that at any length. However, the book itself was hard in that it was kind of a slog. I, and I recognize that this is gonna be a very unpopular opinion. I've had this with a couple books where, and I love snark, I love banter, I love dark snark and dark banter, don't get me wrong. But this was one of those books where it felt like everything was riding on 
snark and banter and like look how edgy we are without really building the character beyond being edgy and snarky and everything being dark. The We were aware of the dangers of this school ad nauseum and it was very info dumpy in how we were made aware of the given circumstances of this world. So it often felt less active when we actually encountered danger. And I never really knew what the stakes were. Like, yes, survival, but we were in this constant loop of surviving these monsters and all we're gonna do is survive these monsters. And because there was no real greater world that felt for firmly established outside of info dump, it was a little unclear what we were building toward and the climax fed into like things that had been established, but didn't feel as tied to other things. I'm not sure how best to explain that. Guess what? I guess what it boils down to is like these monsters don't really feel connected to anything but this endless void that produces monsters. So it's almost like the Sisyphusian task of we're going to fight these monsters, but don't worry, there's going to be more monsters. And then there's going to be more monsters, but we're not going to really know why. It's not going to feel like we're accomplishing anything with that. Now, there could be an interesting commentary there, right? Like this futile, constant fight against evil, the unknown, these monsters. And so it's just... <sighs> It was, a, it was not exactly the reading experience I was expecting or wanting. I did like the back and forth between Orion and, and Elle and wish almost that we could have dug into that a little bit more. And there, I think there was opportunities to be more active overall with that relationship development and how Elle was starting to open herself up to her classmates more because she'd been so solitary previously. The twist at the end was really good. I am intrigued to see where she goes from here. It just was very info dumpy. It was like snark trying to spackle over info dumps and didactic speeches. So I, again, recognize that there were many, many people who enjoyed and, and liked this book and it worked for them. That aspect just didn't work for me. There were parts that did. Um, but again, this is all kind of overshadowed by really valid criticisms of how race was handled in the book. So to go to a book I really, really love, Legendborn, so I was kind of disappointed with The Deadly Ed Education, I'm not gonna lie, because I was expecting that to be a big book. Um, for me this year and then I went into Legendborn and this was everything I wanted it to be and more. I've talked about it at length. I'm still in love with it. I am excited to see more people fall in love with it every day. If you haven't read it, read it. <laughs> I'm eagerly awaiting more from this world. I love it so much. Okay, and then I listened to Before the Ever After by Jacqueline Woodson. This is a middle grade novel and it follows a young boy in, I think the 90s. And his father is a football player. And it is kind of around the start of when we really started knowing more about concussions and what impact concussions can have on players and families. And I don't know a lot about football and I don't know a lot about football history. so take that with a grain of salt. But I love Jacqueline Woodson and I loved the voice of this. I loved the little boy in this who was just trying to make sense of his world as it was changing. And he had a group of friends that, that tried to be there for him. And the language of course was poetic. I listened to it so I didn't get to see how it was laid out on the page. But I, I loved the narrator in the audiobook. I loved the voice. There was just this earnestness and yearning and you I just wanted the best for this boy for this family as they were struggling to make sense of how someone they cared about was changing and struggling and 
it was just really good. I'm not usually a sports book person, but I am a Jacqueline Woodson person. So if you have readers who really love sports or realistic fiction in your life, this is 100% a book that you should gift them because it's really gorgeous. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, I've also talked about. It's just lethargic and haunting. I guess I'm using haunting a lot today. And it just is a cool, crisp fall day. And I, I've talked about this on a feature Friday, but I really loved this book. Spoiler alert by Olivia Dade. Okay, so romance, <laughs> kissing on the cover. So this is um, a romance that I think I, I previewed and knew like very little about and have since read about a fat protagonist who is a fan fiction writer and also a geologist, I believe. And she, unbeknownst to her, is in a fan fiction beta like writing friend well she knows she's in a, a friendship with her beta writer and she does better beta writing for her and i'm probably saying that wrong because i've realized i've never really said it out loud and this friendship just happens to be with marcus who is the lead in this like game of thrones style show that is based on the aeneid and he can't tell her who he is, but she tweets a picture in cosplay at one point and it gets some buzz online and some people are being jerks about her body and he jumps in to basically ask her out on a date and show everyone that she's gorgeous and support her and then they have to deal with this in that he knows who she is she doesn't know who he is she likes the guy she's friends with digitally and would like throw this potential relationship with a star away for that she's not super impressed with him at first because he plays like this dumb character in public and has this persona but she starts to see through that a little bit and gives him a chance. And some of that is predicated on the fact that like he's pulled away from her as it, there's a lot going on. It's really good. It's really sweet. It deals with perception and public image in multiple ways for both characters. And it also really is an engaging look at fandom. It sets up a second book that sounds fantastic it is just a lot of fun and i you should read it it's it's good so next was the damned by renee actia which is the sequel to the beautiful so the beautiful the damned it's good right here's where it gets a little complicated is that this book i thought was a duology probably also because everything she's done is duologies and I don't know that I've seen a third announced, but it this book is very much a, a middle book. It expands the world instead of resolving things. Plot lines are left unresolved or with like open ends. And again, like it, it expands. So, you know, it feels like a middle book. And the a part of me is really sad because the beautiful and the damned is just such a good, it's so good, right? Like, and now what's the third book gonna be? But also we add like fairies fair or fairy-esque characters here. And keep in mind, we're already dealing with like vampires and wolves and that's kind of the world we were living in. And now we have fairies. And I like fairies. I like urban fantasy that throws everything in. But here it just didn't feel right. I just didn't know why it was there. And our our main leads are apart most of the book, which is 
fine, I guess. I did like, like, the decadent vampire side of things here, especially in, like, uh, historical New Orleans. Like, it, it just felt lavish. But I had a lot of moments of, like, hmm, which was kind of a bummer for me because I really like this author. And I thought the first one wasn't perfect, but it was fun. So I guess this one also isn't perfect, but was still fun. But like, they're just, I don't know the world about the way the world was expanded, I guess. It just, and I don't know how that plays into where we're going. And as a reader, what the stakes of that are. So, but the titles are just so good. Okay, the next one I listened to again was Empire of Wild by Sherry Demoline. Yes, of Wild. I believe this actually came out last year. It is a horror novel that explores colonization, but it's all encapsulated by the this legend of the Rougarou. Rougarou? I listened to this. I should know how to say it. And this, our main character's husband, has disappeared. And she has been mourning him, missing him, trying to figure out what has happened for months. Like, they had a really solid, strong relationship. And then she, I think, is at Walmart. And there's, like, a traveling preacher. And he is her husband, looks like her husband. And she goes tries to confront him and things get weird so it's a it was a really engaging dark narrative it had a lot to say I really enjoyed it it was a really good listen I don't know what else to say without spoiling something I may have already said too much Lobizona by Romina Garber so this is about a young girl who has lived undocumented with her mother and this woman, like an older woman, for years. And her father, she has been told, has connections to like a, a criminal family in Argentina. And so they had to flee his family after he died and they've been living undocumented in America. And so our main character, Manuela, believes that her mother has been working on getting a green card and getting them papers. Her, She can't really go outside because she has these stars in her eyes, like actual physical stars, I'm C, that make her really conspicuous to people. So she kind of like has to stay inside and when she goes out, she wears sunglasses. And one day she, is home and the older the woman that they live with has a fall she has to call the an ambulance for her and she knows that's going to bring police to the building so she has to run because she's undoc undocumented and she goes to find her mother who works at this rich woman's house and that leads to a whole lot of things and her mother ends up getting taken away by ice and when Manuela ends up finding this whole mystical realm and it's just really good it's really good I I, I don't know how there, there's a lot going on and the the mystical world sometimes it felt like we were being told a little bit more than shown but it was such an engaging space that it created and i really like argentinian literature from what i've read and this felt like the young adult version of that it was imaginative it was playful it had something to say the characters were really interesting especially when we got into the magical world like she has a roommate because there we move into like a magical school narrative then and she has a roommate 
she's the like daughter of the headmistress and she's popular and she's a little standoffish and cold so that we think that she's kind of like the preppy like popular girl and this complicates the idea of that um it complicates a lot and then just like this idea of people being illegal whether it's in the United States or it's in this fantasy world and I don't want to spoil too much there so this was a good start to a series and I enjoyed it. I listened to Shit Actually by Lindy West. I don't know if I can say that, but I guess I can. I'm not making any money off of this. Um, it is her newest essay collection where she writes about different movies. Some of these have been previously published. I just never kept up with any of that writing. So it was all new to me. So she talks about things like the, the essay that's sticking out to me right now is she talks about like the American Pie franchise and uh, that was I was like yeah this is a lot of good points and really made me rethink there was like that whole genre of comedies at that time so it has her usual humor and warmth and insightful commentary and it was something I knew I was gonna need like I needed something it just made me happy and made me laugh and wasn't too serious. So if you need something to kind of take your mind off things, the Lindy West essay collection, absolutely. And then Bestiary, I've talked about this one as well. It's just a really smart novel that looks at intergenerational trauma stories and how they morph and are something you can interact with, but also something that helps make sense of that trauma. It's it's just a really smart, interesting narrative that had that little aspect of weird that I love. Speaking of literary and a little weird, the last book I read was Night Theater by Vikram Peralker. This is like a short little almost morality tale feeling book about a doctor in rural India who is just kind of trying to get through the bureaucracy just trying to kind of get through the bureaucracy of treating patients and one night he is visited by this family who are badly injured he doesn't know where they've come from and they claim to be dead and they say that they he has the night to stitch up their wounds and help them live. They've got a second chance at life through him. And it goes from there. So it takes place over the course of that night. And I can't really spoil anything, but it plays with the ideas of the afterlife and morality and what we've done in life and what may be forgivable and unforgivable. How we think of the afterlife it could be at times that a little slow but i think it was also engaging with some really interesting ideas so this is i i did a, i got through a lot in october especially compared to november and this is just like what i own so that's not bad i did all right November, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, I read lots of really great stuff. If you read any of the books I talked about, I would love to talk to you about them below, especially the ones I haven't really talked about yet. Uh, and sorry that what I had to say wasn't more articulate or thought out. I just needed to talk about some books. So I will see you soon. Have a good one.